Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. Last time we talked about the much despised Monsters Resurrected. My thoughts on it were complicated, Avril Lavigne would be pleased. Today we move on to National Geographic's dino documentary, Bizarre Dinosaurs. The movie mainly focuses on the strange features present in different dinosaurs and what they may have been used for. The answer is usually sexual display, so it gets pretty repetitive. But it also means we get to talk about a plethora of new creatures that haven't gotten a mention yet. While I hope Bizarre Dinosaurs does them justice, I've gotta say... Hold on to your butts. Let's dig this up. Monsters Resurrected did some major disservices to both Spinosaurus and Tyrannosaurus as if it wanted to anger both factions of the Paleo community. Although far from perfect, National Geographic writes some of Discovery's wrongs. Remember how I complained about the Super Spino never shown eating fish, instead just demolishing Rugops over and over? Well, here we get our first proper look at Spinosaurus fishing. Our boy is even using the very likely waiting method similar to a heaven, standing in the water and snatching out fish. T-Rex sees some redemption after its small arms were mocked before, to which I had to point out that although small, they were still strong. Strong enough to outlift anyone at the gym. Bizarre Dinosaurs raises the same point, how each arm can curl about 400 pounds. He's strong. I'm strong? He's super strong. One huge win for this documentary is how it frames the debate over Pachycephalosaurus headbutting. Instead of pushing one side of the controversial issue, audiences are given viewpoints for and against, then are left to decide for themselves whose evidence is more convincing. Horner, as always, tries to go against the grain, even if that grain is well founded in evidence, so he argues that the dome was too brittle for combat and would have been used as a display structure instead. Paul Serino and Robert Bakker refute this, pointing out that the bone was strong and thick, like 8 inches thick, Carl Weezer thick, plus the attachment point of the neck and neck muscles would have been useful in shock absorption. Recent studies in 2012 and 2013 have found cranial pathologies, or injuries, on the heads of pachycephalosaurids. As many as 22% of their skulls found show damage from blunt trauma you'd expect from agonistic behavior. So it seems like once again, we need to hand this to Jack Horner. However, there is redemption for the man. Since 2007, he has proposed and pushed the idea that the other two Hell Creek Pachycephalosaurids, Draco Rex and Stiggy Moloch, do not represent their own genera, but different growth stages of Pachycephalosaurus. The evidence being that, well, we only have adult Pachys and juveniles of the other two. The simple answer would be, it's because there aren't adult Draco Rexes or Stiggies. They all lived at the same time and place too, Western North America, during the Maastrichtian stage of the late Cretaceous. And finally, their skulls exhibit a high degree of plasticity, allowing the bone to change over time. This supports the argument that as a single species, they lost their spikes and grew their dome as they matured. Stiggy Moloch doesn't get a mention here, but Draco Rex does and these arguments are mentioned. I'm not going to tell you guys at home that this is the definitive answer, but in my opinion, it does seem likely that they're just younglings. Additionally, done well is the Nigerosaurus, and I will pronounce the name as closely as I can to the documentary. One screw up here can kill the channel. Like its Rebecca sword relatives, the Nigerosaurus is portrayed with this neck that's almost comically small for a sauropod, and a wide, vacuum-shaped head. It's the Darth Vader of dinosaurs, and that's Sereno speaking, not me. We see this animal grazing on low vegetation, using that battery of teeth to pulverize its food. I love the contrast between it and another sauropod, Mementisaurus, which took the exact opposite approach. The Mementis neck grew to ridiculous proportions, which allowed it a larger range of feeding. Perhaps the easiest and lowest hanging fruit of a hypothesis to debunk is the idea that Parasaurolophus used their crests as a snorkel, allowing them to breathe while submerged. Several other strange functions have been proposed over the years, like intraspecific combat, serving as an airlock to keep out water, and an expansion of olfactory tissue for smelling. 
While these hypotheses are easier to debunk than a flat earth, the writers were correct in that the iconic crest was used as a resonating chamber for vocalizations to communicate with members of its species. Do they want a medal on this one? Even with some facts to compliment, bizarre dinosaurs aged like fine milk. I appreciate the effort to incorporate the latest in strange scientific discoveries, but our perceptions of these animals have drastically shifted over the past decade. A clear example is the Dinochirus, which is lacking the same drip as our prehistoric kingdom variant Willem. The holotype of the dino was discovered in 1965, consisting of its incomplete arms. The rest of the body has been a mystery for years since then, which is reflected in this dino doc. National Geographic chooses to portray it as a therizinosaurid wannabe. However, in 2013 came the announcement of two more specimens, which show a far more complete picture. Most remains were poached and sold by fossil collectors on the black market but paleontologists were able to recover them from private fossil collections. Thanks to their hard work, we have a better understanding of the creatures attached to those massive arms. So no, it's not a kind of therizinosaurid or close relative. Instead, Dinochirus was an ornithomimosaurian in the family Dinochiridae. But really, who could have guessed that it looked like this? Like in Monsters Resurrected, we're shown a very 2000s style Spinosaurus. That's basically a giant baryonyx with a sail. Admittedly, this portrayal is better since we actually get to see it fishing, and it's not a giant monster. Nowadays, we know how truly weird the Spino was, or at least we think we do. I'm just waiting for another paper that totally alters our understanding of them. Another sailed dinosaur featured is the Dicreosaurid sauropod, Amargosaurus, with its iconic double sail running down the neck. As of 2022, scientists have moved away from the sail look so as to not be avoided out Spinosaurus. Instead, it's believed Amargosaurus possessed a long keratinous sheath covering each individual spike. This is typically how it and its relative Bahadasaurus are portrayed today. Bizarre Dinosaurs emphasizes the supposed sales use as for display, kind of like a middle schooler's COD KD. Really though, it's likely for features to have served multiple functions. The narrator dismisses the idea of self-defense, but if that head is pointing down to munch on vegetation, those spikes would have been great for thwarting an attack. Regardless, it's great to see this underappreciated long neck receive some love. Us audiences also get our first look at the meat-eating bull, Carnotaurus. For a few minutes, let's overlook the obvious shortcomings to focus on the skin and not in the identity politics kind of way. We don't roll like that here. This popular theropod is commonly portrayed to this day with organized rows of osteoderms running along their back and sides. Well, firstly, what they possessed weren't technically osteoderms. These are, as the name implies, pieces of bone embedded in the skin, often for protection. What the Carno had were just scales. Secondly, a new study as recent as 2021 shows that these bumps didn't come in neat patterns, but were scattered across the body in a seemingly random fashion. Maybe it doesn't look as terrifying, but this is a real animal we're talking about. That thing is a killing machine! <laughs> the last major point I want to mention here is the inclusion of Raptor Rex, a smaller, lightly built Tyrannosauroid from the early Cretaceous that was remarkable for showing such derived characteristics so early on. This is another unfortunate case of fossils being collected and sold on the black market to private collectors, making the exact location of the find unknown. Originally, Paul Sereno thought the Raptor Rex came from the Chinese Yixian Formation due to being found alongside a fish vertebrae from that time. Further analysis of the specimen from Peter Larson and Denver Fowler in 2011 proposed the creature to represent a juvenile tyrannosaurid from the late Cretaceous. He's just a kid, no older than my son. Further research in 2013 on the corresponding fish fossil identified it as belonging to a fish from the Namek formation 70 million years ago. With all that being said, Raptor Rex is now considered synonymous with Tarbosaurus, being a three-year-old, not some special Tyrannosauroid. <laughs> 
Time to get into the serious problems, and there are a few. It's kinda strange how we get Jack Horner, Paul Sereno, and Bob Bakker in the same movie, yet we still are shown the same problems that have been plaguing these documentaries from the start. Ah, oh, sh**. Here we go again. Pretty much all of the dinosaurs shown are shrink-wrapped, which is odd for a film about their weird features. You'd expect more unique soft tissue to show up instead of skeletons with skin. Also, we see every wrist broken being pronated. The nightmares I get are just seeing pronated dinosaur wrists. Then there's the roaring, which occurs pretty much everywhere. Dinosaurs didn't have the vocal organs to produce those loud mammalian roars. And once again, fully grown triceratops didn't exhibit those pointy epicipitals we see all the time. No, they disappeared as the animal aged. Whoever worked on these models clearly snuck them around the experts. Paul Sereno is a paleontologist who I haven't mentioned before on the channel, but when researching, it's impossible not to bump into his work. For that, I'm very appreciative. Eoraptor, Erosteon, Rugops, Sarcosuchus, and many others were named by him, so a lot of segments I've done wouldn't have been possible without him. One other dinosaur he discovered is a tiny pachycephalosaurid from Canada, featured in this dino doc called Mycocephalae, sometimes Microcephalae. Unfortunately, there's no formal description for the little mushroom head, so these names are purely informal, practically just nicknames. As much as I love Parasaurolophus in general, its design here is kinda not great. It could be due to the bad animation, since honestly this is the lowest quality we've seen yet. That sound blasting crest is too straight back. Yes, their crests vary depending on the species, but none of them look quite like this. The paras are also given blobs for hands. I was expecting Steve McQueen to make a cameo. Considering that a mummy of the other hadrosaurid, Edmontosaurus annectans, has preserved front limbs with a hoof-like structure, it's likely that Parasaurolophus had a similar foot, not a blob. Back to the Carnotaurus, its design is also wonky. Aside from shrink wrapping, osteoderms, and pronated wrists, the hands are completely wrong. We've seen this in abelisaurids before. The Carno here has elbows, large hands, and long, clearly defined fingers. He's ugly! 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 Why the animators would make a bizarre dinosaur look less bizarre, I don't know. But their arms should be far less developed. To call them glorified sausages wouldn't be far from the truth. Another problem here is the feathering. Some dinosaurs have it, and some don't. The Therizinosaurid ripoff possesses them, and so does the Scansoriopteryx, but Guanlong and Oviraptor are fully scaled. The Gigantoraptor is given some fuzz, but not nearly enough. It's like National Geographic knows what it has to do, but doesn't have the strength to do it. You can even say they lack the will to do what is necessary. Can't they all receive the love of feathers? Why do the creators choose favorites? I recently mentioned the feathered, potentially arboreal Scansoriopteryx. Bizarre Dinosaurs calls the genus Epidendrosaurus. What? The name Epidendrosaurus appeared first in 2002, but it appeared online. The name Scansoriopteryx was used in a publication that was printed. Because the Epidendrosaurus name was online, it technically didn't count as a publication. Oh, okay, look, I don't make the rules, I just enforce them. So according to the rules, Scansoriopteryx counted, Epidendrosaurus did not, the latter is the correct name. Their nomen dubium is called the size of a sparrow. Well, yes, the fossils discovered are that size, the remains only show the size of juveniles, so they would have grown significantly larger. Oh, and to try to push this I.I. hypothesis that the Scansoriopteryx used its third finger to pick out bugs, the writers forgot that finger would have had feathers on it, long feathers, so not really useful for that purpose. Perhaps it's more likely that that long finger was used for climbing. While many behaviors shown end up within the realm of possibility, one that stands out to me is Mementisaurus smacking each other around with their head and neck. Is there a paper out there to specifically disprove it? Well, 
I couldn't find one, but I'm pressing X to doubt. Giraffes are used as modern analogs, despite not being closely related in the slightest, and having completely different morphologies in the head and neck. Like, really, sauropods had air sacs along their neck that I'm pretty sure they wouldn't want to just slap together. Strange how this is shown without anyone batting an eye, but if two packies bump heads, everyone loses their minds! My final critique, and probably the worst offense, of course comes from Jack Horner. For some unknown, godforsaken reason, he decides to go on a rant arguing that animals don't use their heads for defense. From a logical point of view, the last place in this world you want your defense mechanism is on your head. Alright comment section, do your work. Everyone, name five animals that use their heads for self-defense. Here's just a few. As I've said before, it's admirable when someone is willing to go against the grain, but Horner is a contrarian who doesn't make claims based on where the evidence takes him. He says things for attention. I would compare him to a teenage girl, but then he might marry himself. Bizarre Dinosaurs is a bizarre documentary. I love discussing many of the prehistoric freaks who don't get enough attention. Sadly, it does so while following many of the generic, inaccurate dinosaur cliches we keep seeing. There is a lot of speculation which can be admired, but much of that is either outdated or too unbelievable. I don't want to seem overly negative, this dino doc had plenty of potential, so I think I'll give a rather generous C-. I did call this the Dark Age of Dino Documentaries for a reason. Don't worry guys, the sun is bound to shine... later. Remember, if you enjoyed this video, to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.